My name is Ali Mirsopasi. I am a faculty member at uh, NYU and um, I direct Iranian studies program. This is our first event of the, this academic year and I would like to uh, welcome you to this, um, what I'm sure uh, will be a very, very exciting um, conversation. And um, since this is our first event post um, uh, coronavirus situation, I very much hope that um, um, next semester I see you all or as many as you possible in person and we have our events um, at the university and we can socialize in a more intimate way. But in the meanwhile, this is how we are gonna do our events this semester. And I very much appreciate that you are joining us, particularly that because our events is on Zoom, some of you who do not live in New York area are joining us. Today's uh, panel is on um, is a conversation on the coronavirus and public health in Iran. So the idea is for our panelists to discuss the current um, ongoing um, difficult situation of, of uh, COVID-19 in Iran and how the government and public policy folks are responding to it, but also to discuss this in a more historical, um, broader context of how various states in Iran have responded to similar public health um, uh, um, issues. Um, uh, let me just briefly um, explain uh, the, how the, this meeting, this event will proceed. Um, after I um, introduce our panelists, um, our colleague, um, uh, Orkideh Behruzan will um, moderate a conversation with our two panelists. Um, um, each of the panelists would make their um, some brief 10 minutes um, uh, presentations or make comments and then um, they engage into a conversation. Uh, when that is done, then um, um, we will um, turn to the question and answer. So uh, let me very briefly um, introduce our panelists. Our, um, our first speaker and moderate of today's uh, program is Professor Orkide Behruzan. Um, even before I introduce her, I have to say that the idea and the framework of this panel is of, um, of Orkide, a, um, a now, I, I can say, long-term friend and a great colleague. Um, and I wanna thank you, um, Orkide John, for, um, for putting this really, really interesting panel together. Um, Orkide is currently a uh, associate professor of an medical anthropology at SOAS, University of, of London. Um, Orchide has a very interesting and certainly relevant profile, academic profile, as far as this panel is concerned. Um, Orchide is a physician. She obtained an MD degree from University of Tehran, and then she, um, she studied at uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and she earned a PhD um, in history and anthropology of uh, anthropology of science and technology uh, from MIT, MIT. And as I said, she is currently a professor at, at SOAS. Um, Orchide is author of a really fascinating book that I have read and enjoyed, The Prozac Diaries, Psychiatry and Generational Memory in Iran. This book that I think everybody should read um, was published in, um, in uh, 2016 by 
Stanford University Press. Uh, again, I really want to urge you to, if you haven't read this book, to please do so. Orchide was a 2015-2016 um, fellow of the American Council of Learned Societies, and um, Orchide was also awarded the prestigious Martin Kerr Award from MESA, Middle East Studies Association. Again, thank you, Orchide, and look forward to hearing um, your thoughts. Our second speaker um, is Dr. Hormuz Ibrahim Nejad, a historian of modern Iran, um, who is currently a lecturer at the University of Southampton. Um, um, Hormuz uh, received his BA in history and sociology from University of Ferdowsi Mashhad, an MA and PhD from Sorbonne in Paris. Um, Hormoz has a long list of publications. I only mentioned three books that are relevant to our today's discussion. I hope he doesn't mind. Hormoz's uh, first book was titled Public Health and the Qadir Estate. The subtitle of the book is Patterns of Medical Modernization in 19th Century Iran. This book was published by Brill in 2004. Uh, following this book, um, he edited a volume on the development of modern medicine in non-Western um, countries. This book was published in 2009. And, um, and lastly, he published Medicine in Iran, Profession, Practice, and Politics. This book was published in 2000. And 14, but uh, Hormoz works in other um, aspects of Iranian history and culture. And, um, um, and please check his profile. He is a, is a truly interdisciplinary scholar. Our last speaker of the event is Dr. Mazyar Diabi. Mazyar is also currently, actually at the moment, a postdoctoral fellow at SOAS, University of London. So all three of our scholars are based in UK and two of them in the same university. I have to also say that Mazyar um, will start his new faculty position at University of Exeter in politics department starting next week. Congratulations, uh, Mazyar. Um, this is fantastic news. Before um, he, he joining uh, SOAS, Mazyar was a lecturer at the University of Oxford. That's where I first time met Mazyar. Um, Mazyar also obtained his PhD doctorate in politics at the University of uh, Oxford. Um, I am sure many of us know Mazyar's very um, important book. Um, drugs and Politics, Managing Disorder in Islamic Republic. This book was published by Cambridge University Press very recently in 2019. Um, so you can imagine from um, this brief description of our panelists that these are, um, these are uh, colleagues we want to discuss this topic. So um, I would like to thank you again, Orkidejan, for, um, for your kind offer to help us with this event. And now I turn the floor or the screen to you and um, thank you, thank our panelists, and thank you everybody who has joined us and I look forward to our discussions. Thank you so much, Professor Mirza Fassi. I mean, I'm, I'm humbled after that introduction. You're very kind. In fact, I mean, I'm the one who should thank you for hosting us, for making this panel possible, and for um, inviting us to be. It's lovely to be back at NYU, um, albeit virtually, um, to talk again about COVID. Um, uh, and uh, I, I want to thank uh, Mazyar and Hormuz for accepting our invitation and for this interdisciplinary conversation about COVID in Iran. 
Um, so as, um, as was mentioned, um, several months into this experimental mode of virtual engagement, we decided that it's more efficient perhaps to, to have a conversation instead of presentation. So I'll be um, doing the back and forth, I'll be keeping time, hoping that we can keep your attention, especially on this side of the pond, it's at the end of a very long working day, so I'm hoping that people um, will stay with us for the next hour. Um, and I want to welcome um, our audiences. Um, uh, it's lovely to see some familiar names and uh, faces in the audience. And those of you joining us from Iran, um, special welcome to you. And please do join us in the Q&A uh, to inform, correct, and illuminate us with your undoubtedly more, more immediate experience. Um, now, um, it's become conventional to start talking about COVID um, with numbers and with figures of fatality rates and uh, uh, diagnosed cases, etc. cetera. I, uh, with your permission, I want to intentionally refrain from that in order to invite us to um, think about numbers more critically, think about how numbers and data and figures are collected, interpreted, um, disseminated, politicized, mobilized to different ends. Uh, as we all know, uh, numbers are in the making and uh, the numbers in Iran um, have not always been very reliable. And, um, and so let's leave, leave the figures aside for a second. We'll, we'll get back to them later. Um, and I want to remind us that these figures um, have uh, people behind them. And this is perhaps a good place to offer my condolences to those who've lost loved ones to COVID. Uh, and to commemorate um, my Iranian colleagues, doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers who lost their lives um, uh, during these trying times. I wish their loved ones unending patience and peace. Um, we have uh, each um, been speaking and, and um, writing about um, the coronavirus in the past several months, and I just want to um, give you a very brief overview before I delve into the questions but for those of you who are not familiar with the situation in Iran and to say a little bit about how we got here, how it's all started and what the stakes are. Um, we have the premise here that the epidemic, a pandemic, a public, public health issue is indeed a biological, medical, as well as a sociopolitical construct. And um, the manifestations and the behavior of the outbreak, as well as the way it's governed, are situated in very particular um, sociopolitical and historical contexts, as well as global contexts. So we kind of, um, we're trying to um, provide a view that incorporates both angles, global and, and, and localized angles here. Um, as some of you know, most of you know, Iran became the first epicenter of um, the outbreak outside of China in, uh, in late January, mid-January, um, but officially in late February. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to call that an epidemic at, that, at the time because uh, uh, only after 20, sorry, 12th of March, um, uh, the outbreak turned into a pandemic. So Iran was one of the few countries that was involved before that point. Um, officially, the first cases were reported on February 19th, and this was after weeks of cover-ups and, and um, a lot of us uh, who were um, involved or in contact with people on the ground knew that cases were, uh, not the number of cases were growing um, and that uh, um, ICU, ICU wards were being overloaded with patients um, uh, who were showing manifestations of COVID. And, um, what happened was, um, I'm going to just go over this very quickly because most of you know about this. Uh, the outbreak started in the city of Qom, um, which has its a very significant religious and political and economic um, uh, place in, in the landscape of Iran. Um, and uh, we, we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, and there was also a, an election coming up in February. So there was a lot of efforts to suppress information um, to, in order to make sure that the turn, turnout for um, voter turnouts was not affected. This was whilst clinicians and public health experts were, um, were um, doing everything they could and warning about um, uh, the need for putting measures for social distancing, quarantines, etc., in place. Um, this, uh, um, uh, about two weeks late after the official announcement, 
Iran had uh, one of the highest num the highest number of death actually outside um, outside of China. Uh, and at this point in late February, there was no social distancing, no measures in place yet. And um, I want to emphasize that a lot of the healthcare workers who passed away during that time passed away because they were not using PPE because information had been suppressed. And this has clinical as well as ethical implications, as you all know. This um, cover-up was followed by um, mass mobilization. By, the, by March, um, the government, the army, the IRGC, and um, several social organizations were involved. Um, social distancing and measures were in place, were put in place. PPE was, um, uh, campaigns about education, about PPE was, and washing hands, and et cetera, were underway. S uh, universities and um, schools were closed. Um, and so most of, the, most of what we've seen elsewhere started to happen in March. In April, um, there was a phased reopening of the economy again. So Iran managed to control numbers um, at that time, March was this major peak. Then we had April and um, what was um, called in Iran, smart social distancing, uh, which meant that some businesses could open. Um, in June, Iran witnessed a second peak and uh, in September, a third wave. But my, my physician colleagues um, are telling me that, you know, we don't use the word peak. This is actually a word that's being used in the media here, but for them, it's been a continuous um, situation and, and because when peaks repeat so frequently, they're no longer peaks. Um, and at the moment, most provinces are in, in the red. Uh, and, uh, and unfortunately, we're seeing um, uh, rates rising to the level that they were in March. Now, the, the cover-up in the beginning, um, it's important to remember that it was politically and economically motivated. We have had cover-ups and ex, you know, experiences of the, the disinformation or suppression of information before with uh, epidemics as well. The case of HIV AIDS comes to mind, um, but at the time in the 80s when we had a cover-up about HIV AIDS, it was more ideologically driven. Here we had a series of um, economic and political interests that were clashing. And this clash between, as elsewhere in the world we're seeing now, this clash between public health um, uh, provisions and uh, economic uh, uh, preservation um, is a very difficult, uh, difficult clash to manage and um, remains the case in Iran with the caveat that in Iran, the, the economy is under immense pressure, both for internal reasons as well as because of the um, uh, renewed state, uh, United States sanctions. We will talk about that a little bit later. Um, now, perhaps uh, it's, it's, um, it's also good to remind us of the local context that the epidemic arrived in, uh, the then epidemic arrived in, um, uh, the year 2019 or in the, in the solar calendar, the year 1398. Uh, marked a very difficult year for Iranians. Um, uh, it was a year that saw natural disasters, um, a severe crackdown of political protests, um, very harsh economic sanctions, debilitating people's uh, ability to continue their lives um, uh, as before, as well as tragedies such as the downing of the passenger flight 752 by the I ICRG, sorry, IRGC, um, in January, killing 176 people, and an almost war that um, uh, almost happened in January in the, um, you know, between Iran and the, U the US in the context of the assassination of uh, Qasem Soleimani. So there's a lot of um, uh, ruptures um, intertwined, and at this time in January, this is how the nervous system, the collective nervous system is overstretched and the economic um, context is completely crippled and then a pandemic arrives, an epidemic arrives. So this context is important. Um, comparisons between the way um, this um, uh, outbreak was managed uh, in Iran have been made with elsewhere. At the time, a lot of us were talking about how um, the, the key characteristic of the response, the Iran's response to the pandemic um, or the then epidemic was that its politicization and also the securitization of information about it. Now, of course, since then, we have the privilege of hindsight as well as um, comparative wisdom. And we are seeing a lot of similar and yet very different circumstances in other countries.
it's very important to always uh, situate all of this discussion in a comparative perspective. But we can point to a few characteristics, such as poor governance, um, the response, Iran's response to, um, uh, to COVID has been, you know, characterized by part deceit, part incompetence, and yet medical competence. The medical expertise in Iran has been extraordinary. Doctors have done extraordinary things. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit at the end about the medical characteristics of COVID in Iran, the specifics of how COVID is medically and clinically different in Iran uh, and being, treating, be, being treated in Iran. The other characteristics that come to mind is a crisis of legitimacy and crisis of credibility that, you know, at the end of all these events, uh, in the socio-political context in Iran, um, very low, public trust is an all-time low. Um, there is very little trust in information that's coming from above. Um, and, uh, and of course, I mentioned the US sanctions. Um, there is a crisis of expertise in the, land, in the landscape of policymaking. So a lot of public health experts are warning and issuing um, recommendations, but they're not in policymaking positions. And so this lack of coordination between expertise and policy has been a major issue. It's not exclusive to COVID. It's perhaps the long-term legacy of the cultural revolution, but, but it's been something that we've been seeing in the context of public health in Iran as well. The securitization of public health information in Iran also has a, has a long history over the past um, decades. Uh, and, you know, statistics about suicide, about illness, about mental health, it, mental illnesses have always been secured. And I know that because of my previous research a security issue, but statistics about illness um, and death rates, and especially about pan this pandemic, are securitized. Um, and um, economic crisis and economic corruption going hand in hand with sanctions. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So in some ways, COVID has um, shown us that me by medicalizing a pandemic, we risk um, masking the, the political life and the historical life and the um, socioeconomic life of a pandemic. Um, and perhaps COVID has given all of us um, a crash course in uh, in social science 101, you know, when, with regards to health, that um, you know, epidemics and pandemics are matters of um, bio, socio, cultural, and political constructions. Um, speaking of these social constructions and organizations, Maziar, I want to go to you now. Um, you wrote a brilliant, brilliant piece for Merip a few months ago about the role of social organizations in dealing with COVID in Iran. Um, I want you to tell us a little bit about how COVID has shaped social organizations, cultural conventions, and people's uh, political ideas. And also how um, eight months later uh, into the pandemic, how has your na analysis um, evolved? Um, has anything changed? Um, what are your thoughts? Thank you. Thank you, Elkide. Uh, and thank you to NRU for having us here, Ali and everyone else. Uh, so I'll start with the second part of the question um, about how my analysis sort of updated or, you know, after, after seven months and so, so much and so little happening because our lives actually still are a bit suspended in these epidemic times. Uh, in, in my piece uh, for, for Merip, uh, published in April 2020, it looks like ages ago, uh, I started by describing a short vignette uh, of a small village and the events surrounding this village uh, at the outbreak of the epidemic. It was about an elderly peasant uh, in his 70s who, after being sick for a week, uh, he died. Most of the people in the village thought that uh, it was due to COVID and that they kind of avoided the family of the man and, and because the village was a closely knit community, many members were part of the same extended family and everyone expected a very large funeral. He was a quite well-known figure in, in this small village. Uh, instead, very few people attended. And those who attended did so by enforcing a quite rigid, strict uh, social, or I prefer to say physical distancing, uh, wearing gloves, masks, and do not exchanging all the courtesies that are typical of, um, of Iranian funerals in particular. So this was out of the fear of COVID-19, that their old rituals of mourning, even the perception of death and solidarity with the people who are suffering from you know, someone who has left this world, 
were abandoned and were replaced by new rituals. Uh, these are the rituals of science, of public health, and, 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 uh, and of what is the new, the new normal, which is distancing. This is not a minor transformation. And in the daily occurrence of life, this has a lot of meaning. And we still, I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, I've sort of come to a, an, an analysis or finished analysis or response of what this means. But I think it's something that we need to look at to understand how life is transforming itself and what it could look like in a sort of post-epidemic future. So after six, seven months, I, I you know, giving this opportunity to me to, to speak uh, to, to this audience, I thought again, okay, what has happened to this village? So the village is, you know, of course, um, it's not a source for generalization of life in Iran or even less so of life globally. But it, in a way, when things happen at this micro dimension, they kind of give us the opportunity to see how far reaching this transformation has been. Because if it happens on a very small, far away, distant village, you know, which is really in a way unconnected, although it, I'll, I'll explain a bit more later, it is actually very much connected to, to, to life in, in the capital and elsewhere, we can see how cultural transformation and actually ethical shifts occur. So after seven months, I, you know, I contacted a few people. Unfortunately, I cannot go there, but this is a place I carried out some field work following the publication of my book, unrelated to drugs, uh, mostly about life and technology in small village. And, and so I contacted a few people and talked to them. And I noticed that many people who had previously migrated to Tehran and other local uh, urban centers had come back either because there were no jobs or because they felt a bit more safe. They felt safer in the context of rural Iran where COVID at the time and still now has been uh, uh, less widespread or actually not widespread at all in the rural context. So now things have changed. There is a sort of a centrifugal effect. People are going away from urban centers uh, and, and the villages are regaining some popularity not only among, you know, sort of migrant workers who have left the villages and the families, but also among city dwellers who, you know, we know for many decades have quite despised the idea of village living and, you know, considering the village as a place to, to, to kind of interact with. And the risk of reverse migration, migration you know, which I think, uh, or the potential of race migration became very serious as well for public health reason. You know, if you think that the, this actually meant that the virus could be spread to communities that were up to then not affected by it. And, and so uh, villages themselves organized and asked for basically sort of enforced their agency on the national scale by asking, uh, by actually putting a sort of checkpoint at the entrance of villages and not allowing people to get into the villages. And this was uh, enfranchised by uh, governmental regulation that basically allowed villages to prevent up to the month of June people from entering the villages. Um, I'm unsure, I mean, as to whether this is going to be a last you know, a lasting effect and whether villages will become, you know, a sort of the next frontier of development in Iran on the next frontier of a sort of a, you know, a reconfiguration of state society relation. I, I'm actually, I don't think so. But the return to the village may be part to a broader shift away from the metropolis, Tehran in particular, where the environmental, sociological and economic uh, challenges to life have become uh, enormous. And that Tehran itself is seen today, and it is to some extent, a site of danger in health and social terms. And health and social dimensions, as Orkide, I think, very correctly said, are two sides of this epidemic. Where, you know, we tend to listen to the news and hear a lot about the health dimension, but epidemics you know, do have a very strong social dimension. And the rhythm of the health epidemic is often not the same as the rhythm of the social epidemic, which is the perception that we have by listening to the news. Um, in fact, I mean, to go back to Tehran then, you know, let's, uh, which is the capital, the very opposite of the village I was looking at. Uh, it is the hotspot of criticism of, of contagion at the moment. And, 
and, and the sort of uh, very much the epicenter of the epidemic now. The situation has worsened week by week. We won't enter to talk about numbers, but the numbers are very high. You know, uh, 13 to 15 part of the population, and this lives in informal settlings and in informal dwellings. And this is another dimension that affects very much the social life of the epidemic. People living in uh, uh, housing that are not, uh, you know, with the same health and social uh, infrastructure. Uh, of course, are at the higher risk of, of, of being infected by, by the virus. And, um, and that is why the virus so far has been much more aggressive and much more widespread among people who uh, are at the poorer uh, uh, end of society. Um, it is not the case that many of the migrant workers live in the southern part of Tehran in the you know, neighborhoods of Molavi, Khayyam, Islam Shah, and these are also the hotspots of, uh, of, of contagion at the moment in the city. And they are the, amongst the poorest of the capital, even though they are currently actually going for a sort of uh, gentrification, uh, which I don't have the time to talk, to talk about. But the gentrification will affect further health consequences, either within this epidemic or with future health issues because it will push these marginal populations of either migrant workers or work, poor working class people so, more southern along the metro line one, the red one, that goes towards the very outskirts of the city. This is already happening. This is connected also to another large population of marginal citizens, which, are in, which in Persian we call Hashin Nishin. So the sort of uh, uh, either uh, foreign migrants, which are actually very local, the Afghans who have been living there for, uh, for, for ages, or uh, uh, poor uh, sort of homeless often people, or uh, people who with health issues, or but with a social stigma such as um, drug use, for instance. Um, and this has made it very difficult for the Iranian state to manage the epidemic because this population is often non, not legible from uh, the, the perspective of the state. They don't have a fixed dwelling. Uh, they don't have uh, papers, for instance, often identification cards. Uh, and this, of course, in a situation where legibility of, of numbers and of the presence of the virus is key, has brought the government to use social organizations to basically treat this population rather than using you know, sort of uh, uh, state-led public infrastructure. Uh, but compared to what I wrote seven months ago, I find that the level of um, the level of uh, mm -hmm. a sort of efficacy and the level of mobilization that the state used to intervene in these very problematic areas of Iranian society have not really evolved, and the sort of initial impetus, the, the, the initial momentum really faded away and which leads to another point i think which is which was key in that piece and i think was very much of interest to probably the rest of the world which was that the iranian state used the paradigm of the iran iraq war mobilization in reference to the response to the covid epidemic but this is significant on many levels first of all as ali uh, said we are in the 40th anniversary of the uh, uh, of the of the Iran Iraq war, and uh, and also because the Iranian state, anytime it's faced with a crisis, often seeks refuge in the paradigm of the Iran Iraq war. This this again, together with the same sort of uh, idea of mobilizing grassroots forces, was not really implemented in full force. It it happened in the first few. Uh, weeks and months, and then it faded away. But it stayed there very much at the level of rhetorics of state propaganda and distribution and the legitimization of health workers to which Okide referred, which are now defined as Modafeone Salamat, or actually, as the Supreme Leader said, as uh, uh, Marty's in office, Marty's in duty. So at the very high level. But that means also that Iran needs heroes, which to conclude, makes me think a lot about Bertolt Brecht, which is what a sad world, the world that needs heroes. Yes.
Thank you, Mazir. Um, I'm, I'm glad you, you raised um, the, the issue of uh, the 40th anniversary of the Iran Iraq War, which is a topic very close to my heart, but also very relevant here. Um, in a way, we are seeing the, the afterlife of this, uh, this um, war and COVID intertwined, um, which is a very nice segue to go to hormones now. Um, in a way, COVID is living within the afterlife of a war because that war never ended. And in a way, COVID is bringing us a new uh, war and the rhetoric of militarism and the rhetoric of the sacred defense, as you uh, rightly pointed out, um, is very uh, prominent here. I wish we had time to talk about that. Um, uh, Hormoz, uh, let's go to you. So, As a historian, can, ha, how can you place this experience and today's experience in a wider historical perspective? In other words, would you um, tell us a little bit about the continuities and the changes um, in response to epidemics and contagious diseases, um, discussing the history of these concepts uh, within the framework of modern public health in Iran? Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank you for inviting me to this um, uh, to this uh, uh, conversation. Um, uh, this subject I have not made um, field research uh, in Iran, uh, uh, but uh, I have tried to put together a sort of comparative uh, view on. Um, um, various epidemics that um, uh, uh, raged in Iran since the uh, 19th century and find out how we can uh, see that uh, from that uh, wider historical perspective, COVID-19. Uh, we have been, uh, uh, most of us, uh, reading epidemics in books uh, uh, and in history and uh, were ne uh, never believed that uh, we could be engulfed by uh, the terrible pandemic uh, or epidemic in Iran um, in spite of all scientific uh, progress that could, um, we could not um, uh, know from where it comes this uh, uh, epidemic and uh, how it does spread and uh, what are its symptoms and so on. Um, we are even unsure whether the vaccine currently under construction will be effective. So all of these are reminiscent of uh, the medical knowledge of our ancestors on the epidemics of uh, their own time. And uh, that were, uh, was, um, were shrouded in mystery. Contradictions and lack of uh, clarity uh, of our um, uh, preventive medicine about COVID-19 reminds us of uh, the age-old uh, vagueness of the concepts of contagion and miasma that were deemed to cause epidemics uh, of cholera and plague that shook the world in 19th century. Uh, the terminology of diseases in each language reflects the way people uh, of that language experience those diseases. Contagion Contagious diseases did not have the same meaning in, uh, uh, in, uh, in each country or in each region. In the old medical text, uh, uh, the concepts are completely different. For example, in Latin, uh, contagion does not connote the term contact, but also it uh, uh, conveys the idea of emanation and uh, miasma. Still in the 18th century, Europe contagion could still be spoken of as being uh, contaminated through the air. In Hebrew, sharad, uh, if uh, I pronounce uh, correctly, because I just got these uh, information from secondary books, I'm not a uh, linguist, uh, referred to various uh, repulsive scaly skin diseases, uh, but can also denote contagious fungal infestation. In some Islamic texts, not only disease, but also impairment and physical disability uh, are understood as contagious or transmissible uh, diseases. So similar ambiguities can be found in other languages. In the 19th century, this blurred view uh, became a bit clearer because they 
made a distinction between contagion and miasma. However, traditional physician in 19th century in Iran, um, uh, they, they were not clear on these two questions. For example, uh, whether plague was transmitted by contact or through miasma or air, foul air, were ambiguous. On one hand, in theory, they believed that Baba, uh, referring to all kinds of epidemic, was due to corrupt or corrupted air. On the other hand, they, uh, the same physicians uh, during the epidemics avoided um, sick people because they feared contaminations and contagions. Uh, so when uh, uh, Mirza Muhammad Tari Shirazi uh, wrote his Ta'uniya uh, on plague, treatise on plague, uh, criticizing his contemporary colleagues uh, for their fear of uh, contagion. Even Shirazi himself, who criticized, in fact, uh, rejected contagion, uh, when he discussed Ta'un, uh, he uh, refers to Ta'an, the root, and uh, he translates that as piercing with spare, uh, which implies uh, the concept of contact. Uh, from the point of uh, humoral etiology, um, fever was produced uh, when corrupted air entered the heart and through there uh, was diffused throughout the body through blood circulation. And uh, um, then it uh, created um, uh, what they called uh, unnatural uh, or harorate qariba, unnatural heat, harorate qariba. Uh, if that unnatural or um, the, uh, uh, sort of um, 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 uh, heat uh, was uh, uh, affecting uh, organ, uh, it was called uh, yaum, day, and then uh, it, and if it had affected the akhlat, the humors, it uh, caused infectious fever uh, and epidemic fever was that of that kind. So um, uh, this, um, in fact, uh, the outbreak of an epidemic was due, therefore due to corrupted uh, air. The theory of contagion did not uh, gain currency in uh, 19th century Iran because they did not believe uh, in germ theory, like Fracostoro, Fracostoro, uh, or, uh, or pathogen. The problem uh, with contagious theory was that it did not explain how, at the same time, many people were uh, affected while they were not in touch with each other. Um, however, from the critical essay of Shirazi on Taun, we learned that uh, many physicians, although they could not explain how, they believed in some, some kind of contagion, so um, uh, because they avoided. So, in 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 uh, in fact, in um, it, it, they were anti-contagionist in theory, but contagionist in practice. Um, although the theory of miasma is no longer uh, accepted, uh, and uh, we um, uh, to, uh, you know to explain the outbreak of COVID nineteen. Uh, it is striking that it is still at work um, in the idea of social distancing and uh, uh, avoidance of crowd uh, as it uh, does clo uh, in closed space as it, uh, because they uh, social distancing are meant uh, to prevent air corruption and uh, in fact coronavirus is airborne uh, is believed that it is airborne. Um, Yet it is uh, not clear why, uh, uh, how coronavirus spreads. Effectiveness of the social distancing of two meters has not proven by scientific uh, experimentation. In other words, the two meters social distancing is a compromise as more than two meters would have made the life in our packed uh, streets and supermarkets uh, even more, uh, the life more miserable than it is. So. Um, or, or, or the wind is not uh, sure whether uh, wind is responsible for its movement because uh, research shows that it is uh, transmitted even in the stagnant uh, 
uh, air, but uh, humidity, for example, is uh, known as responsible for uh, its transmission, faster transmission. Um, so in traditional medicine, uh, a sign of Waba also is uh, that uh, when the air is not, uh, when, when there is no sun, sun is weak, and the air is not ascended through evaporation uh, to high sky, the putrid vapor uh, does not ascend, and then it would cause uh, cholera. So uh, these are co uh, co some kind of uh, some some similarities, but there are uh, major differences between uh, COVID-19 and previous epidemics. One of them is the uh, age group that it uh, affects the most, uh, unlike, for example, influenza that uh, uh, targeted the children and the young population, um, and the morbidity, uh, the, the case rate and mortality, the death rate also is different compared to previous epidemics. Um, uh, one uh, major, uh, other major difference uh, between COVID-19 and previous epidemic is uh, that, uh, is a simple thing, uh, I mean, everyone knows, is that, uh, the, and, the, uh, and it has uh, uh, important political implications to my view, is that whilst unlike the previous epidemics, the, Z, the epidemics uh, receded and uh, with season and uh, um, res resurfaced uh, uh, after some time, uh, COVID can only recede through lockdown and uh, uh, resurfaces and intensifies with the easement of lockdown. Whence the increasing role of the state in the age of corona, which is particularly important in the case of uh, clerical regime in Iran. So we know that public health straddles between medicine and politics, uh, uh, health and economic, uh, etc. Uh, so in uh, Iran, uh, um, uh, in, in Iran, this uh, issue of uh, inter interference of po uh, uh, politics in, um, in uh, the matter of, uh, uh, in fact, COVID, what I wanted to say is that COVID in have, uh, have increased, uh, the, provided more ground to this government to interfere in social, uh, social life and uh, uh, impaired uh, further civil uh, civil society. Thank you so much, Amos. This um, this historical context, and I and I also love the fact that you brought brought up the linguistic context and how uh, you know an epidemic and a pandemic and any public health issue has a different life in different not only different cultures but also different languages. Um, speaking of languages, let's switch to the language of medicine for a second because I you know one of the things. I mean, we're not, as, as Maziar uh, rightly mentioned, we're not going to give you a final analysis because whoever has the final analysis, I, I really want to meet them. Um, but we, we're trying to give you different flavors of the different aspects that we, we think um, need to be um, looked at and taken seriously. And as social scientists, sometimes we, um, we in a way, uh, overlook the, the, the biology of, the, uh, of, of an illness. Um, just to give you a sense of what's going on in Iran in terms of the clinical aspects, uh, um, because we see a lot of uh, discussions about the government response, but um, what are actually doctors doing and the characteristics of the illness? Are they different in Iran? Are they in any way uh, affected by, the, by this context that we discussed, historical context, um, political context, um, social organizations, et cetera, et cetera? Um, from the early days, um, one of the things that's, uh, you know, quite outstanding is that in Iran, the first, you know, the, 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 um, the, the golden diagnostic uh, approach is still the um, long CT scans. People are not re relying as much uh, or as a first step on the test uh, as they are on CT scans. Again, I have to emphasize that we have um, the, you know, Iran has uh, uh, this treasure of extremely experienced um, uh, doctors and nurses and health workers who are nonetheless working in a healthcare infrastructure that is at times um, uh, disorganized and uh, at times politicized and at times um, uh, crippled by 
on the one hand, um, the impact of sanctions, which I will tell you a little bit about because that's also a very complicated issue and it's usually very simplified in discussions. And also on this, on the same, uh, at the same time, why internal corruption and, and mismanagement and uh, issues that I mentioned. Um, there is so much we don't know about long COVID. And again, as elsewhere, when we started this work in February, um, you know, we didn't know, I mean, I didn't know that, um, you know, three months later, we will be have discussions about the same, you know, long COVID here in the UK. And of course, in the United States, um, the situation is even more um, complex uh, and tragic. But we don't know much about long COVID and that and the, it, most, most of our emphasis has gone to number of deaths. But um, what's important is that this pandemic is not going anywhere anytime soon. And what is going to stay with us, uh, unfortunately, is a lot of unknown in, with regards to how the nervous system, the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system are going to be affected. We already know that there are um, brain and nervous system implications. Um, we, we are, in, and these are discussions that are ongoing also inside Iran. In terms of the debates, um, the clinical debates inside Iran, um, I probably can tell you that it's not much different from anywhere else in the sense of the, the, the clinical discussions. Um, we're thinking about the same uh, treatment issues. Um, in terms of treatment and standard of care, you'd be, um, um, you might be interested to know that uh, most of the medic, I mean, there is no single medication yet for, for COVID, but most of the medication that is used uh, elsewhere is also used in Iran, um, uh, you know, in terms of uh, antivirals, IVIG, um, steps, all of those things are also used in Iran. Uh, remdesivir is being um, used in the context of a trial that's only in hospitals, but it's, um, it's provided in the context of trials. So with these things, um, Iran is not really lagging. In fact, Iran started, Iranian doctors started using uh, convalescent plasma in March. And that was before, way before it, it started in the UK. Um, and I believe in the US. So in a way, um, because of the, you know, the, 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 there was not much in, by way of regulations to go through to, to set up a trial. And that sometimes works in favor of, in, uh, of us in developing countries. So, um, the other thing to bear in mind is um, uh, there were uh, uh, innovations also under underway. For example, portable portable units and centers to lift the burden uh, on hospitals. Um, again, there was a period that um, the um, burden on hospitals was controlled. Unfortunately, right now, um, as of today, um, we have uh, the same issue of shortages of ICU beds and. Um, in a way, the situation in terms of the hospitals is quite similar to uh, to what it was in March, with the difference that um, there is a lot of um, demoralization and fatigue, as as elsewhere um, in Iran too. I mean, um, we were all um, uh, clapping for the NHS workers and doctors and nurses here for months and months, and now people are not doing that, and the healthcare workers are exhausted. And I want to emphasize the fact that. The, the healthcare system um, uh, is comprised of actual people who are exhausted. And one of the issues Iran is dealing with is a shortage in nursing staff. That's been an ongoing issue. And um, unfortunately with COVID is exasperated. We have lost hundreds of um, healthcare workers and essential workers as well. And that's a huge loss, but also, um, in, in historically uh, speaking and, in, and, and culturally speaking, the loss of doctors and nurses is also the loss of the locus of hope for, for the Iranian society. So the psychological implications of losing um, doctors um, with their uh, quasi um, sacred status uh, in, the, in the sense that they are what society trusts um, in the absence of public trust for, for the establishment or for information coming from above, Doctors are the go-to people. The information, uh, the management of information and management of public anxiety over the past seven months has largely been done only by the healthcare professionals because the government failed in the management of public anxiety. Media essentially failed for about two months in the beginning. Um, again, uh, uh, um, an interesting fact in Iran, there is a 24 seven um, television channel called Salamat in health. Um, so Iranians are very, very keen on medical information. And um, 
And that TV channel was not mentioning COVID until mid-March. And so this is the kind of mismatch I'm talking about. So the doctors were basically not only doing the clinical work, and healthcare workers not only doing the clinical work, but they also had to do, as, as in many other instances in the past, they also have to kind of do this social management as well, uh, which kind of is linked to what Mazir talks about in terms of social organizations, in terms of um, uh, uh, you know, civil society, mutual aid, people, you know, so all these volunteering, all this work that is outside of the purview of clinic uh, becomes extremely important. Um, there are certain hospitals and wards that are dedicated to COVID as, a, as in elsewhere. And um, Iran has also joined COVAX, um, this global initiative um, working uh, towards the uh, an equitable um, access to the vaccine that's supposed to come to us so to, to make sure that um, lower income com countries also receive the vaccine. Um, in terms of virus mutations, we know that um, this virus has um, over 80,000 mutations worldwide. We, we know that there are a lot of mutations. Not all of them are extremely meaningful. But um, th these past few weeks in Iran, it's been announced. And, and Again, you have to really situate the announcement of scientific news and public health news, again, in a cultural context, in, in the way they are producing meaning. But it was announced by the Ministry of Health that, um, and, and the research centers that um, in Iran, 23 mutations have been identified. Four of them are exclusive to Iran, apparently, and haven't been seen elsewhere. What that means, we don't know. But what we do know is that the virus has become more contagious, not more, uh, uh, it's not killing more, but it's infecting more. So there are numbers going up and that might or might not have something to do with these mutations. Um, so all of these discussions that, you know, on the genetic side and the viral side and the epidemiological side are underway in a, in a very advanced um, uh, in, uh, manner. Um, and uh, we know that the virus is now more potent um, and we're approaching the flu season. Again, there are parallels with um, everywhere else that you guys are joining us from today. Um, you're also dealing with similar issues. Um, restrictions are sort of in an on and off yo-yoing back and forth. Schools were opened and now um, in, the country is forced to finally ban uh, the, some of the religious ceremonies that uh, a few weeks ago were allowed, but the sequel to them, which is due now, uh, is not allowed. So all of these um, issues are because there is a shortage of ICU beds and the burden on hospitals has extremely uh, has risen. The impact on different groups of people is also extremely important. Um, since February, I, you know, whenever we talk about COVID, I've been trying to um, uh, raise the issue of the, the psychological and mental health impact of COVID also in Iran, which is, like everywhere else, an important topic. But in, in the context of Iran, um, it, it is quite unique in the sense that the, the, there is a very fragile, wounded psychological context underneath all of this, as I mentioned, um, with the recent events. Illness itself is an anxiety provoking uh, entity. Um, then there are losses. People have lost loved ones. Uh, people are worried about lost, losing lost, loved ones. And then the economy has deteriorated in ways that is having a significant mental health impact. Um, and now, obviously, there is also the question of the political impasse. There's been crackdowns and political oppression, all of those things uh, intensify at times and, and they are not separable from the question of COVID. We cannot really talk about COVID without talking about these things. In, in a way, COVID is not a single issue and uh, the same way that sanctions are not a single issue and the economy is not a single issue. They, and and in, in, as anthropologists, we, we also are familiar with the concept that we call deaths of despair and deaths that come not directly from the virus, but from the afterlife of the virus, from suicide, from unemployment, from poverty, from uh, also intersecting crises such as the refugee crisis, food crisis, uh, crisis uh, the climate change, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And these are not individual traumas, and in a way, they are social ruptures that are perpetuated and and superimposed onto each other. Um, specific groups are also at, at risk, as, as in elsewhere in Iran, they also include um, 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 Afghan refugees, of course, prisoners, um, homeless people, the bereaved, um, uh, healthcare workers, wage workers, um, uh, people who are affected by socioeconomic inequalities, as well as isolated people. Now, um, 
the in in terms of the health infrastructure i think one of the things that we need to seriously think about is is you know increasing capacity for um, rehabilitation efforts for the healthcare infrastructure and also healthcare human resources because um, we've we've been there once before with veterans and the there are um, institutionalized ways of thinking about um, providing support and, and rehabilitation for um, uh, for veterans and I don't want to use the military metaphor I just in terms of the, only in terms of the immediate you know, contact with crisis. I think uh, this question of rehabilitation for healthcare workers is extremely important. Um, now, in terms of this, um, uh, these different social groups, um, you know, uh, I want to go back to Hormoz again. Um, Hormoz, can you tell us a little bit about the, the perspectives of these different social groups um, historically? How, in light of um, uh, epidemics, how, how these concepts have been perceived, approached, and addressed by the clergy, by um, politicians, by medics, by ordinary people. How are different social groups, um, uh, you know, sh how have they shaped their relationship with pandemics and outbreaks? Um, well, I mean, these social groups change uh, opinion, uh, you know, um, they, um, they, devolve, they evolve, uh, they develop, so their opinions are not the same. The clerics uh, uh, had different ideas uh, 50 years ago and now towards uh, modern medicine, etc. So th this is what I'm going to, uh, how, how I, I understand. Um, so know that, uh, you know, uh, what uh, uh, I, I wanted actually to continue with, uh, uh, with my previous uh, uh, discussion was that, uh, in fact, uh, coronavirus is not the last one. It will be other epidemics and uh, um, the experience of uh, um, previous epidemics and now uh, shows that, that knowledge-wise, we are not much better equipped uh, to identify the treat, uh, and treat the COVID than uh, uh, we were hundreds of years ago regarding plague and cholera and other diseases, etc. So uh, you see, for example, uh, no longer as uh, no longer than two decades after biomedical uh, science actually was hailed as being able to put an end to all epidemics. Influenza pandemic arrived and uh, uh, claimed the lives of more than 50 million. So uh, what, what is very important is that, in fact, um, however advanced uh, science are, uh, we need to see the cultural and political factors uh, uh, how they, in fact, you mentioned uh, at the beginning uh, these, this aspect, uh, the importance of this aspect. So um, uh, let, let me start with uh, some case studies. In the 19th century, uh, Mirza Mamad uh, Tehrani uh, devoted a part of his treatise on cholera, uh, on uh, you know, humoral analysis of how cholera appears and then a list of drugs uh, appropriate for treating that. And the second part of his treatise, he gave a list of um, prayers and from religious texts uh, to prevent and cure cholera, including the one that, uh, you know, to dilute uh, of the Koran water and then drink it. Um, so, um, uh, um, in, in, at that time, medical discourse, in fact, uh, informs um, the uh, people's discourse on discourse, uh, di di people's understanding of uh, disease as well. In modern medicine, uh, the, uh, we have uh, this um, um, uh, anatomical pathology that influences the understanding of COVID, etc. Um, so this amb ambiguity uh, of uh, all of these uh, concepts of disease, etc., cetera, um, uh, give rise to traditional and modern approaches, appro uh, you know, uh, to, uh, that, that uh, are mixed uh, in the understanding of COVID today in Iran. Um, one of the 
um, uh, one, one of these prescriptions or uh, analysis, popular analysis of uh, COVID is that, um, um, is, is that according to, uh, is that coronavirus enters through uh, the respiration and before uh, reaching the lung, it stays four days in the throat and produces coughs and uh, sore throat. Uh, as soon as the cough and sore throat starts, uh, we need to drink water in order to stop there uh, before it le uh, reaches the lung, etc. So um, uh, the other case, for example, they, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think that I can really because of the lack of time to, to search for uh, my PowerPoint. Uh, other, other cases, they, uh, uh, they believe that, they say that, um, uh, for example, onion, if uh, you drink, you, you eat onion, uh, two onions per day, you can keep cure uh, the disease, uh, etc., etc. I, uh, uh, what, what I wanted to, to say uh, is that all of these uh, case histories to cure cholera, uh, to cure uh, COVID, um, is perceived as it is uh, described and identified uh, by uh, people, not by our scientists and, uh, and uh, modern educated doctors. Uh, so uh, none of them are conformed by, uh, are, are conform uh, with, uh, with uh, what the doctor says. Um, what, what is important here is that uh, unlike the positivists, positivist view uh, uh, that finds uh, disease as a, a natural fact and independent of our knowledge um, to be discovered by uh, scientists. Uh, we uh, critics, in fact, uh, see disease and illness uh, from normative phenomena. Um, you know, uh, uh, for example, uh, some uh, like Ivan Illich believes that illness is the atrogenesis, uh, genesis, so doc caused by doctors, in fact. Or uh, Foucault believed that uh, the disease entity is not naturally given, but is uh, um, defined through medical discourse. Uh, so these findings, uh, in fact, uh, support this social constructionist approach, uh, according to which we that, that could help us to understand uh, how disease is perceived by, by people. Um, so uh, some diseases like AIDS, for example, are stigmatized or leprosy, etc. And, uh, uh, and uh, so the way the people are treated, uh, in fact, uh, is influenced by the way it is perceived. Uh, so um, therefore, uh, uh, it is important to see from cultural and, uh, uh, and, and social perspective how diseases are perceived by the patients rather than uh, just uh, uh, give a definition uh, 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 according to modern uh, uh, science. So um, um, th there are uh, three uh, social categories uh, with different approaches towards uh, coronavirus. The first is clerical regime uh, that I believe uh, it, it is not to be confound, uh, confused with the clerics uh, themselves that are part of the clerical establishment. Um, clerical regime at the beginning of the revolution, they promoted traditional medicine and uh, or Islamic medicine. But uh, Today, uh, we see that the clerical regime does not uh, recognize traditional or alternative medicine in the treatment of cholera, uh, COVID-19. And the government uh, set up a, a committee for fighting against cholera, uh, corona, Comité de Corona, that is entirely according to Rouhani, based on modern uh, science, and uh, accepted, approved by international, um, in international bodies. Uh, so the government is known for its moderate policy inside and outside, but the thing is that this policy is uh, the same also for the hardliners. 
the Revolutionary Guard, the mouthpiece, which is Force News, uh, regularly reports uh, state-of-the-art scientific, technological, uh, medical news. For example, in one of them, uh, it says that Royan Institutes studies the mutations of the genome of SARS-CoV-19, which is essential to finding treatment and controlling disease, etc. I don't know how, how long, because I, I am very nervous with the time. Um, so how, how long I have time? You have one minute left. Well, uh, okay. So uh, hopefully we'll come back to that. So uh, I, I wanted to say that uh, the, 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 and, and then there, there are two other groups, that is the clerical regime. The, the, the two other groups are the ordinary people who usually adhere to alternative medicine because they, for non, political nonconformity, uh, because the confusion over COVID that is not clear, and also um, um, uh, be, be, uh, for cultural reason. And the second, the other group are the traditional Orthodox Shiite cleric who also are uh, against, in fact, uh, 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 government's policy on quarantine. Uh, so, uh, but, but the thing is, what, what is very important is that uh, uh, some of these clerics comes to, uh, the, so to support the clerical regime uh, in order, to, in, in its policy, for example, Allah al Huda, uh, who, uh, who, uh, in, in fact, uh, in his uh, Friday prayer, uh, encouraged people to not to go, discouraged, in fact, to go, not to, uh, to go to, to um, uh, shrines, because he believed that, uh, um, he believed that, in fact, uh, uh, imams themselves are subject to natural law. So he tried to associate between the uh, traditional Islamic medicine and modern medicine in order to, uh, in order to set up, to support the, uh, the, the clerical regime government. So I just wanted to say that there are three, therefore, social categories that have different perspective on the, in terms of dealing with um, coronavirus. Thank you so much, Ramos. Um, so I think for the final question for uh, Maziar, I want us to zoom out a little bit now. Um, speaking of different cultural practices, as Ramos was mentioning, and historical context, we also very much see um, uh, this interse intersection of socio-historical conditions in other places. We cannot talk about COVID in Palestine without to, you know, understanding it in the context of the logic of occupation and its impact on a healthcare infrastructure. In Lebanon, you have a failed state, you have the impact of lockdown on creating starvation and violence. How do you balance decisions about lockdowns and about um, uh, you know, the economy, this, this um, problematic binary of the economy uh, versus um, healthcare? In India, we've um, had also debates about um, how the experience of lockdown has, create, has resulted in loss of shelter for a lot of people, people and livelihood. Uh, and these things become a matter of survival. In Hong Kong, one of the more successful um, uh, examples, on the other hand, we have similar situations with political oppression. The, the protests were immediately cracked down uh, in the context of responding to COVID. Turkey, next door to Iran, um, we have similarities in terms of the cover-ups. Over 500 detentions um, early on were reported because of, uh, for people who were disseminating information about COVID. This happened also in Iran, uh, a lot of detentions. And of course, the intersection of global crises as well, such as the refugee crisis, food crisis, um, climate change, etc. So, Mazir, from a comparative perspective, um, I want you to tell us a little bit about uh, what this pandemic is doing to the future of civil society, collective well-being, and uh, and social stability. Where is the pandemic taking Iran, uh, specifically from a comparative perspective, um, in relation to cultural practices and social organizations and political ideas? Like the epidemic, I think you know it has a particular life in Iran, but it has a global life, and it is to say it with Marcel Mauss, is it total social fact. It is something that affects societies in all the aspects, legal, economic, political, cultural, and health, of course. We tend to forget that now. Uh, it also creates a specific ethics of life. And this ethics of life, actually, I think is something that really is what this 
sort of is making it a, a sign of a different time to come, which is we are living in a moment in which biological life is more important than community life, than social life. That's what, what I mean. It's not only me saying this. I mean, this is some of the reflections that Didier Fassan has come up with in the, in the recent years. Uh, the fact that our survival as bodies, in terms of strictly speaking, health of our bodies, is becoming more important than the life that we have as citizens, as people who are part of a community, uh, and therefore our political life. And this led me think also conceptually to, to, to some of the things that Giorgio Agamben uh, the Italian philosopher uh, came up with with the distinction between zoe, the bare life of people who are exposed to the violence of states or of diseases, uh, and that of bios, life qualified as life in a society, as political life. Uh, well, we live in the moment in which, including, uh, this is across the world, by the intervention of governments and the state, uh, civic life is compromised, is sort of put on suspension in favor of Zoe, of, of, uh, of bare life, of you know, st life, strictly speaking, as a medical condition, as, a, as health, as survival. And, and as Orchide said, this is across the world. And you know, the, of course, governments are adopting different interventions. And the, the, the most, the governments that are most authoritarian have often or at least described as such, have often uh, adopted very strict measures. China, Vietnam, among democracies, authoritarian democracies, South Korea, uh, or uh, in countries where the state is particularly strong, like Italy. You know, the presence of state in the public sector is, is very strong in healthcare particularly. Uh, very strict measures. So our expectation comparatively was that Iran, as a state that is relatively strong, very present in society, in the social life and economic life, would adopt very strict measures. But that wasn't the case. On the contrary, Iran has been probably closer to another case which I'm quite familiar with, which is the British case. Uh, very reluctant to intervene in economic life initially, then in imposing some lockdown, abandoning quite soon, for very different reason from the British case. Why? Because of what we have mentioned so far and everyone is aware of the sanction regimes that according to a recent economic uh, analysis by Saleh Esfahani is causing an increase of putative increase in one third of deaths uh, or at least people who are infected with severe conditions. Uh, which we, you know, we can think about the long-term condition, which Orkida mentioned, this is like beyond imagination. Uh, but it, it is, there's also something else. It's not only simply a strong state and you know, more intervention. There is something that is happening globally, and I wonder what will happen in the Iranian case, which is that this bare life, you know, life seen as a non-political and non-civic a, a, a life world, if you want, <laughs> playing with the worlds, uh, will affect people's movement and people's rights in the future. If you look at history, another comparative case is that of HIV, although, of course, very quite different. But uh, several countries up to the 90s, 2000s, uh, put severe restrictions to people who had HIV from traveling, from applying for visas, HIV AIDS, of course, I'm talking about both conditions, actually, both state, uh, state, uh, stages of the condition. Uh, in the Middle East, that was quite general practice, uh, although not in Iran uh, following the, the 90s. Uh, in Russia, you are required still now an HIV negative test to stay longer than three months. Countries like Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Kuwait, Lebanon, and so on, uh, require uh, an HIV test. So there were talks about the sort of health passport among people who will live in the near future in order to travel. Uh, I don't think this is something, you know, that it's simply just uh, coming out because of the pandemic. This is something that is being created and sort of uh, uh, pondered in the practices of states through the decades. 
But the, 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 what is happening is an acceleration of these trends in, uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, in terms of uh, sort of uh, social organization, the epidemic will have very deep impact. And again, Iran in this case is more comparatively similar to some of the cases. I think uh, Orang uh, uh, asked a question about education. Yeah, definitely that's one of the cases I think most interesting. Uh, with the acceleration of the epidemic in Iran, but within a longer trend of digitalization of education that is existing within the country, uh, there, there's been an introduction of a digital platform which is known as SHOD. Uh, the platform, which is currently more or less operative, of course, it, it is providing about half a million classes per day. So you can imagine the, uh, the sort of technical complexities of doing that. Yeah, we struggle with a Zoom call with colleagues, you know, but you know, uh, it, it's operative. And what is interesting that it has also brought free access to the internet to students. So it, students are not paying for internet fees. They have access to the internet to, you know, attend classes, despite all the problems that the platform may have. The, I, the, the, the principle behind it is very interesting. Tablets have been distributed, not of course, in an equal way. I mean, Iran does not, first of all, produce laptops as such. So, you know, importing them is even more complicated at the moment, if not impossible. But there's been a, a sort of an attempt at introducing a sort of more or less uniform access to digital education in a country which we know is very large and also with a very strong rural component where access to education through the internet may be very complicated. But this speaks about the longer trend of how digitalization in Iran has been a rather success story over the last years. Uh, to go on in terms of uh, cultural practice, one thing that in comparative terms made me think a lot, and this goes to Holmo's point about the clerical uh, approach to, the, to science and religion. Uh, one of the, in, in Catholic countries, you know, like Italy, for instance, the imposition of lockdown and social physical distancing measures brought to an end, or temporary end, the rituals of mourning and, uh, and of, uh, of uh, sepulture for people. So this is a very important step uh, and, and a very important ritual, a liturgy for the Catholic uh, clergy. They abandoned it in the name of science if you want, or at least giving up their actual secular role in society as priests. Even though, the, this is a reflection Agamben very interestingly came up with, even though the Pope, Pope Francis, is named after the Saint Francis, who was known to hug and embrace and comfort, and comfort sick people. So it's, this is, a, you know, it's an epochal moment. In Iran, this has not really happened, even though the government has put limitations to the burial and uh, to the sort of final rituals before the burial, uh, groups of low level clerics have mobilized in order to actually provide these services for people, which are, you know, we have to adopt a non-judgmental approach. These are for some people an, an, an intrinsic and important type of life process. It's not something that we need to judge in terms of this is religious and therefore is actually superstition or it's you know, uh, secular and is good. It doesn't work like that because actually the spread of the virus has occurred in football matches in stadiums as much as in religious rituals. Both kinds of ritual are their different ends. I'd like to thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you Hormuz and, uh, and Maziar and especially Professor Mirza Pasi, the, uh, our lovely friends at the Kevorkan Center and the Iranian Studies Initiative. Um, you've been very kind hosts. And, that, and thank you everyone who joined us from different, across different time zones. Um, I just want to wish everyone good health in these trying circumstances and um, please look after yourself and each other. Um, goodbye.